I'm Carl Wells. Today my guest is a financial professional. He's been keeping an eye on financial markets and the economy most of his life, all with a view to providing his clients with the best investment advice he possibly can. He's also somebody who's kept his eye on the economy and industrial development of Newfoundland and Labrador. Today he's here to talk about the historical path we've been on in this province in terms of our economic and industrial development. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome Larry Short. Welcome, Larry. Thank you very much. Larry, first of all, I suppose we should start with codfish because it is the cod fishery which brought us here originally from Britain. Mm -hmm. It's um, it sustained us. It's the reason we settled here. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering how important was the cod fishing industry of Newfoundland and Labrador to Great Britain? Well, to give you an indication of how uh, much cod was shipped, in the 1700s, uh, we were s uh, sending per year between 50 million kilograms and 70 million kilograms of cod into the European market, into back to Britain. And Britain was then um, exporting that primarily to the Mediterranean con uh, countries, because quite frankly, Britain could get cod from Iceland and from the, the northern waters. But the, the salt cod that um, was being produced in, uh, New in Newfoundland on shore mm -hmm. had a particular uh, value because it could, could be preserved a lot uh, longer than the green cod uh, that was being produced by the French and the Spanish and the, and the Portuguese. And just let me back up a little bit. So green cod basically is um, you're, you're uh, out on the uh, Grand Banks and you have lots of salt. You could afford salt. Mm -hmm. Whereas England did not, could not afford as much salt as uh, the Mediterranean because in the Mediterranean you can essentially uh, distill your own salt from, from um, condense your own salt from salt water. You got the, uh, you know, the sun of your climes, etc. Whereas um, the, uh, England to a large extent had to buy its own salt. So, so salt is relatively cheap for the, for the Spanish, for the Portuguese, uh, and, and for the French. So when they're over here, they're staying out in the ocean, uh, layer of salt, layer of cod, layer of salt, layer of cod, and then leaving and going back, right? And that was called green cod. And it was uh, considered to be of a higher quality. Personally, I don't like it, but I've, I've had it. It was like, mm, okay. But it didn't have the, it wasn't preserving as much, it wasn't easy to preserve as much as the salt cod you got on shore. So the English, uh, uh, because we didn't have as much salt, ended up on shore and took a longer period to dry it and salt it and it preserved longer. And that allowed that to be exported and stored in particularly the Mediterranean countries. And the other factor with the Mediterranean countries was that, remember that um, there was the, um, the uh, Reformation uh, of the church, so Britain was Protestant, the predominantly uh, Mediterranean was still Catholic, and the Catholics w had so many feast days when they could not eat meat, plus every Friday, right, um, they couldn't eat meat. So the demand for salt fish was huge. And then the third element was that that gave, that exporting gave Britain foreign currency, which they really, really wanted. So hugely important for, for uh, the cod fishery um, for Britain. And of course, the fishery here really has established us internationally, didn't it? Yes, uh, Newfoundland. Yeah. Um, but still, our fortunes went up and down with the the price of cod and its availability, and also with the number of wars. Right. So the restriction was, you know, when when wars broke out with Spain in uh, late in the 1700s um, that those ports were closed so you couldn't you couldn't ship there mm -hmm. but at the same time you know the, the, and when the Americans acted up and decided that they wanted to become independent then there was the shipping to them that that froze up so that England wasn't buying from them but then that opened up the Caribbean right it was it was happening so it it fluctuated dramatically by price 
um, by the supply um, as well as the, the, the wars were really quite significant. So in the mid-1850s, we achieved responsible government. Mm -hmm. And around that time, our colonial neighbors to the west of us started talking about forming a confederation mm -hmm. called Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, we kind of toyed with the idea of joining, but ultimately we didn't. Right. Now, I've often wondered what would have happened had, had we joined Canada mm. 157 years ago instead of joining in 1949. What are your thoughts about that? What do you think would have happened? Well, look, first of all, look at the reason why we didn't join. So uh, Nova Scotia was considered to be a competitor to Newfoundland in terms of fishery, item one. But more than anything, we, we were importing and exporting to Britain more than anything. Right, so our, tie, our economic ties were, were with England. And it was really only after, um, or during the Second World War, after the Canadians and the Americans came here and started establishing um, you know, the bases, et cetera, that uh, imports and exports to Central Canada picked up. So by the time the Second World War was over, 64% ballpark of our uh, imports were from Canada and 4% were from Britain. And that was almost the complete opposite of where we were in the mid-1850s. So what advantage would we have obtained by joining Canada? I mean, we would have been relatively early in, but would, would we have had more rights? Would we have had more, more um, we, we probably would have developed faster uh, economically because quite frankly, by the time we did join Canada, we still had that economic pyramid where you had you know seven to ten families that controlled everything right so we, we were the poorest nation north of Mexico in North America um, by the time that the Second World War showed up and there was no middle class whatsoever so we may have developed a middle class a bit more but I, I, other than that I, I don't see how it was a huge I can understand why it didn't happen because there was no ties uh, to it what was the advantage to um, to the Newfoundland economy to join. There wasn't anything that really, that really stood out there. Now, William Whiteway was the prime minister who wanted us to join Canada. Yeah. He couldn't convince us to go along with it. But he was very keen on economic development, industrialization of, of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And he, he accomplished three things, the dry dock, mm -hmm. Uh, the Bell Island Mines mm -hmm. and the Newfoundland Railway. He started that. And it's arguable that a railway really was something that was needed. I mean, most countries needed a railway to really uh, industrialize. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do, you think, uh, do you think that's the case in Newfoundland? Do you think that that railway was really necessary to to build us up, to get us away from the coasts. Right, well, when you first look at it, um, the answer was no. When I first looked at it, I said, I don't understand the motivation of this. Mm -hmm. We have about 200,000 people. You know, this island is, I don't know, what is it, the 13th largest on the planet. It's just an incredible amount of land and resources. Even you know, like, when you throw in Labrador, just, just to give you a perspective, even today, we have uh, 500,000 people, which is like the size of Hamilton, Ontario, spread across an area that's the same land mass as Japan. That's, that's how much land we have. So back then, even if you just focused on the island, that's just, why would you go to the expense of building a railway for th this? And, and I could not understand what was going on there. Sometimes I worry that politicians tend to run with, um, you know, it seems to be a good idea at the time, and, and, and that, gets repeated in, in history that if, if the rest of the world is doing this, well, maybe we should be doing it as well. Um, because uh, the initial thought then went to, well, maybe they wanted to move something and then we got into the mines, right? Buchan's mine in particular, massive development, absolutely massive development, but minerals are cheaper to ship by water than they are by train. And the factor is 12, it's 12 times cheaper to ship by water, even today, than it is by train. So that, that wasn't making sense. But you so, still have to get it from Buckins to the water. Sure, but, but that was, the, but the, and that's what they did. Was they they went from Buckins to Botwood, to that harbor. Now that harbor ice is over in winter, but then you'd store it. So it wasn't really 
uh, queuing in a lot. But what was the other element that was happening was negotiations were happening with Britain and Britain to France over the French shore. And the French shore, west coast uh, element to, to it. So I think that Whiteway's motivation was that he wanted to have something that looked like sovereignty in order to say that it was the west coast was connected to, uh, to St. John's, to the capital. Um, by this train. That's the only thing I can really see as being a motivator because it just on a pure feasibility basis, it just didn't, didn't make sense. And, and uh, I think the only time that it, it really ever even broke even was the Second World War. So, right? and, and so, again, back at the time, looking at does it really make sense or has to be some other purpose for it? And the only other purpose I can find is that he was trying to, to link the province um, and part of that may have been the fact that the, the Brits wanted some sort of permanent link to uh, the, the St. John's, but I, I can't, because other than that, it doesn't make sense whatsoever. And even with the method of financing, of course, which was the granting of land, yeah, we have tremendous amounts of land. It's something that you can, you can give away, and, and, uh, and we're still seeing the effect of it today. Um, but even then, the what was given away was, a, you know, an incredible um, amount of land and rights, including mineral rights, that we're still facing today. When when mining companies go and and start looking in um, areas in the central part of the uh, island, they're encountering these these reed properties and the, and the rights on those reed properties. Now that's an interesting point you brought up. To to get the railway built, we made these concessions to the Reed Company. Yeah. Um, we kind of set a precedent there for, for the future. I mean, because concessions uh, and incentives have been given to many developers <laughs> who've come in here over the decades. Uh, have we been too generous? Uh, so the short answer is yes, but the other side to it is we've all, so in, in, in every circumstance where you as a province or we as a province are operating from a position of weakness that is we w we want it or we need it more than they're willing to to uh, they can walk away from the deal and say fine and so this repeats over time and time again everything from Churchill Falls on through is the fact that whenever we're operating from the from the position of weakness our negotiation position is is just almost untenable so in hindsight yes much more was given away than should have been given away but at the time with the lack of capital the vastness of this province um, and the need to to link the west coast in some fashion uh, what other choice was there there was no money there was no cash available and there was not a lot of competition who were beating the doors down to say yes i want to put a, a rail line in there and at the end of the day it all it, it lost money so even if we had the cash up front it would have been it would have been more hurtful certainly back then to have a bankruptcy arise that would have affected uh, the citizens more mm -hmm. now uh, I want to talk about commission of government. From 1934 yeah. to 1949, we had a commission running our affairs. We gave up responsible government. Mm -hmm. uh, some people were appalled by this uh, and continued to be appalled by it. A lot of people thought, well, it's a good thing they didn't do such a bad job. Uh, I suppose if you look at things like uh, cottage hospitals, Newfoundland Rangers, which they established, uh, and they did ultimately get us in the black, I guess. But it's hard, it's hard to believe that, you know, um, giving up a responsible government and not, not kind of being in charge of our own destiny, mm -hmm. make, taking our own decisions, was the best thing for us in terms of our, you know, development so, well so two things one is that the British government made it a condition that they would only help financially if there was a commission of government so by the time again we roll around to the 1930s it, it wasn't a case that we really had a choice that um, we needed to be bailed out and the and the, the the Brits said well they did put a limit on it though they said it was going to last for X yeah. number of years right and it went on way beyond yes because we we, we, we that was when World War two showed up mm -hmm. and then the initial thought was that Britain was going to have to keep bailing us out so, so they, they effectively said yeah we'll write you a check for this period of time and then you you know we'll help you and then you got to be back on your feet and what was really interesting that happened and and why 
you know, my, my own parents said to me, you know, it was one of the best governments we ever had. So you got to be really careful. And, and we, again, we should see this showing up time and time again in our, um, in our uh, political life in, the, uh, in, in this century is that people confuse res how their own personal economic situation improved or degraded and associated with the actions of the, of the government in power. Right. So so what happened during that period of time from the 1930s to 1945 was that the economy, once that the Americans and the Canadians showed up uh, building the bases, absolutely boomed. $100 million was spent here by the Americans, $65 million was spent by the Canadians into an economy that just was, you know, uh, at bare bones. And so uh, employment picked up dramatically, demand for goods and services picked up. Um, receipts went into the government to the point where the Brits did not have to write the check anymore to the province. And the province was actually loaning, giving interest-free loans back to Britain. So, so people looked at that and went, wow, we should keep this government going. Because they associated, they thought it was a cause and effect, and not a correlation. It happened to be that because the economy boomed and people mm -hmm. felt better, they said, well, that's the type of government we should have. Not understanding it, it had nothing to do with it. It was the world that, that changed, that brought the economic boom to the province. And so they falsely concluded that it was the government that was causing the, the benefit to them, when it wasn't. It, w it was the fact that if indeed there had been a responsible It was the Americans. It was the Americans and Canadians <laughs> who were spending so much yeah. money here. And even to the point where it was, uh, it was only 1944 that the government passed a law that said you had to get paid wages in cash. Prior to that, it was the old truck system, right, which was, which was the credit system that you owed to the fish merchant, right? So you can see how dramatic the changes would have been from 1934 to 1945, you know, over an 11-year period that the economy goes from destitute, people being on the dole, and with no uh, idea of the future, to suddenly there's cottage hospitals all over the place, that there's airports, that there's demand for, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, people for uh, unemployment drops significantly. So um, that's what the effect that happened, not because of, of the, the, the commission of government, any actions that they took, but if, if indeed we had been fortunate enough to survive through the 1930s, whatever government got elected in 1939, they would have said that that prime minister would have been the greatest prime minister ever, and mm -hmm. it would have been a huge question as to whether or not we would have even considered confederation at that point. Mm -hmm. So speaking of confederation, 1949, we did in fact join Canada, yeah. and uh, we must have looked like a, a pretty good uh, deal to the Canadians in 1949 because we were flush. Yeah, we had we had a lot of money. Yep. Uh, so uh, bringing us on board was wasn't such a bad deal for them. Uh, but in, t in terms of the actual contract we made with Canada, what do you think of the deal? Was it a good deal for us or a bad deal? I, one thing which always bothered me was that we gave up control of the fishery, which seems to me to be a very, very uh, bad thing to do. Yeah, I, again, in, yeah, in hindsight, yes, it, it was our primary industry. And again, if you look, when when we were joining the um, the BNA Act was already in, in effect that the Federation was put together and here were the laws of jurisdictions and and buying into that uh, we bought into it lock stock and barrel meaning that the division of, of, of uh, rights within the provinces and uh, and federally were already set up um, uh, Smallwood you know potentially could have brought up about the fishery as being a separate item yes but looking at the alternatives, primarily, you know, joining with the United States, I don't think we would have been. We we may have we may have ended up being wealthier for the very wealthy, but the social programs that the uh, Canadian government had in place, including baby bonus at the time, because that was already in existence, that extra five dollars per child back then was an absolute godsend, right? So. And, and over time, if you look at it, I mean, how would, how would the province be now with, um, you know, potentially 
um, fifty or sixty thousand dollars for tuition for Ramona University. Uh, you know, potentially for maybe that's high. Maybe it's twenty, thirty thousand dollars, but it would certainly not not be as low as what it is today. Um, and the fact that we would we have still had as many hospitals and healthcare that was paid for. So yes, in you know, was it a missed opportunity? Absolutely. Would it have have blocked uh, Confederation? Maybe not, because. Um, the, the primary motivator for Canada was that they didn't want the United States blocking a major uh, route. I mean, that was the deal, the discussion that was happening between Britain and Canada was that you've got to take these guys because otherwise, you know, we, we could get blocked on, on this side if we ever get in a dispute with the Americans uh, because over previous centuries, we've had many disputes with the Americans. Um, so yes, in hindsight, yes, we should have tried to at least bring it up as being an element. But I can understand why it, it happened that way, because you were buying into the whole deal rather than breaking it off to be separate. Because the other part to it was then, why was uh, not, not just a fishery, but you know uh, the, the entire battle we've had over jurisdiction of the offshore oil, right? That also was, you know, now of course nobody's thinking about that as well. And that's, and that's the, the difficulty is trying to figure out what is really going to uh, be valuable in the future. Now, Smallwood, um, our first premier, didn't really seem to be as concerned about the fish tr fishery as he was about industrialization, bringing mm -hmm. factories <laughs> into Newfoundland. And he, he made deals with a lot of German developers to come in here and build rubber boot factories, chocolate factories, whatever. Mm. Um, most of which failed. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you think about that whole whole period? He, he was afraid people were going to leave Newfoundland in droves, mm -hmm. um, you know, to go work on the mainland if he didn't do this. Mm -hmm. so, well, it, it, we're back again to the same, like, other, other, other places are doing this, so why aren't we doing it, right? That same mentality, like, you remember back in, in the 1960s, um, 50s and 60s, uh, it, there was the... Um, American German scientists competing against the Russian German scientists to see who could get to the moon first, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, so where's our German scientists? Where are our uh, industrialists? Where, so that whole mentality of this is where we're gonna go to, to get these, these people. And he was, uh, I guess, grasping at straws in many cases because, you know, in, in reflection and looking back to say, why didn't these, the money go to Newfoundland and Labradorians to develop it ourselves? We forget there was no middle class, right? There was the very wealthy, and there was the very poor, and there was nobody who, who, who had necessarily the entrepreneurial spirit, who really uh, was was uh, you know at the time, other than you know some shipbuilders and, and the like, that really were available with that knowledge. So I, so again, trying to uh, grasp at at, at uh, what he thought was a good idea at the time understandable but uh, you know again not done with maybe enough forethought larry before we run out of time there's one question i want to ask you i want to talk about iceland mm. iceland has always fascinated me it's got um, many fewer people than than newfoundland uh it has fewer uh resources it doesn't have oil mm -hmm. it's got a great fishery of course uh, and yet it's very competitive with us in terms of gdp and so on what is Iceland doing that that we're not doing? Uh, so there's always the hmm. so what, uh, just think back again as to joining Confederation, right? The, the one of the um, key elements was the social benefits of joining Canada. That's one of the things that that caused people to be uh, choose Canada eventually. And uh, the, the, the entire social benefit, the welfare state concept, um, was really brought into um, North America by Franklin Delano Roosevelt it, with the New Deal in the 1930s, where the government will support the poor. His statement when he first brought in this legislation in the United States was, uh, welfare can become uh, the opium of a nation. That is, if we make it too easy, people will be not, not be motivated to move uh, forward in their lives, they'll just rely on the government. That was the general statement there. And my, one of my worries is the fact that in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, 
uh, often we have stripped out the motivation for individuals um, to be entrepreneurs and uh, individuals to um, uh, t to be more participatory. So and what I'm getting at is the fact that the biggest difference between ourselves and Iceland is what's called a participation rate in employment, that is who is going to work uh, versus Iceland. So in Iceland, 81% uh, of the people who can work um, try to find a job. The unemployment rate is 3.3%. The recent numbers for Newfoundland is that 56% of people who can work um, are looking for a job, and the unemployment rate is about 8.7%. Mm -hmm. So just uh, just on those two factors alone, I mean, there's other factors, including the fact they're using some, some uh, thermal um, uh, uh, sources of electricity in Iceland that allows for manufacturing, uh, you know, to feed into the green uh, mm -hmm. uh, economy. But the biggest single factor is how many of us are actually working. Mm. It's been a great uh, chat. Yes, uh, I've enjoyed uh, talking with you, Larry. Uh, and before we go, I just want to give a plug to uh, Larry's book, uh, also uh, co-authored, by the way, uh, with his wife, Kimberly Short. It's called The Last Act, and it is available in bookstores now. Thank you for watching, folks. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>